Funding for this program was provided by the Wallace Alexander Grabodi Foundation, the General Service Foundation, the Deer Creek Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the annual financial support from viewers like you. Where in the fuck did you get that? We are no longer talking about a political issue. This is not a political issue. This is not an issue of rights. This is not a social issue. This is a dead baby. This is a dead human being. And what are you doing with it? baby was attempted to be buried three times. Not the church, not the state. Women must decide our fate. Not the church, not the state. Women must decide our fate. Not the church, not the state. Women must decide our fate. Not the church, not the state. Women must decide our fate. Not the church, not the state. Women must decide our fate. Not the church, not the state. Women must decide our fate. What about the baby's rights? What about the baby's rights? What about the baby's rights? You're all gonna go to hell. abortion as a personal, moral, legal, and political issue is moving to new levels tonight. The Supreme Court's abortion decision, Roe versus Wade, today's ruling legalizing abortion. The Supreme Court today returned to five. Abortion and contraception go back thousands and thousands of years. So does the question of who shall control them. Our attitudes about controlling human reproduction through abortion and contraception have changed radically over the centuries. So have our perceptions of the moral and ethical issues involved and how they should be resolved. Today, our country is divided over the issue of abortion. Our newsrooms, courtrooms, and living rooms ring with terms like pro-life, pro-choice, fetal rights, and reproductive freedom. 350 years ago, abortion was also an issue, but it was talked about in terms far different. Terms like fornication, quickening, and the concealment of sin. The first documented surgical abortion case in North America took place just 250 years ago. It's part soap opera, part ghost story. In the spring of 1742, in the rolling hills of northeastern Connecticut, Sarah Grosvenor, a 19-year-old, found out that she was pregnant. Her lover, Amasa Sessions, was the son of a local tavern keeper and militia lieutenant. One third of all couples in New England at this time conceived children before a child before marriage. So it wasn't unusual that Sarah had become pregnant by her lover. For reasons that we don't know, he did not want to marry Sarah. And he went to a physician in a neighboring town, a physician who had a rather shady criminal past 
and purchased from him a powder, an abortifacient. By early August, Sarah had not miscarried, and Hallowell decided that he must operate. And then the doctor, opening his satchel, took an instrument out. Then he tried to remove the child for some time in vain, putting her to the utmost distress. At last, she observed he trembled and immediately perceived a strange alteration in her body, on which she desired him to call in somebody, for she feared she was dying, and instantly swooned away. She did not at that, in that episode, uh, abort. But two days later, when she was at home, she miscarried. Her sister and her young cousin buried the fetus in the woods. And perhaps at that moment, they thought they had successfully covered up the fact that Sarah had been pregnant. But very soon, she became very sick. She had a fever, delirium, convulsions. In mid-September, Sarah died. The story was hushed up for three years, perhaps to save the family's reputations. Oral tradition in Pomfret has it that the story came out because Sarah's sister was very troubled by her conscience and that Sarah's ghost visited her sister's bedroom at night and, and urged her and pled with her to tell the story. The Connecticut authorities came to Pomfret and charged Hollowell, the doctor, with abortion. He was later found guilty of the misdemeanor of abortion. Colonial New England was governed by the common law tradition which our nation inherited from England. Under that tradition, abortion was a crime, but it was only a misdemeanor, not a felony. And only late abortions were criminalized, those which occurred after the point at which woman was so-called quick with child. To try to abort before quickening was not a crime. Quickening was understood as the time when the woman felt the fetus move within her, and that could be anywhere at about four or five months. The quickening doctrine was rooted in medieval theology. The medieval understanding, the understanding of biblical times of how pregnancy occurred, was that the sperm included a homunculus which was uh, a fully formed human being, just very, very small. But the homunculus was fully formed in the male sperm, and if the woman was fertile, the homunculus would grow. Basically, the medieval concern was about saving souls, and the idea was that an aborted fetus, if it had a soul, would go to hell because the, the soul had not been baptized. No one talked in those days about, for example, as you see now, the health of the pregnant woman. And people didn't really talk about much about fetal life. People really talked much more about the protection of the soul. So even the early English common law was deeply bound up in religious understandings of the purpose of life, the purpose of life being salvation. In English common law, though, abortion after quickening was criminal act, but it wasn't equated with murder. What they were most concerned about was not that a fetus had been destroyed, but that Sarah Grosvenor had lost her life. For the young people of Pomfret, Sarah's abortion raised a moral issue, but the issue was not the abortion itself. When you examine their own language describing these events, we see that what they're most concerned about, what they're most guilty about, is their sense of that abortion was used to cover a prior sin. In this case, the sin was what they called fornication, sex before marriage. That we find absent in the 18th century of discussion of abortion as being bad in and of itself. The concern is not so much about abortion per se, but that it's used as a cover-up. And that's a very different sort of discourse than the one one finds in the late 19th century when people are trying to make all abortion illegal. The first American law regulating abortion was passed in 1821. It expanded Connecticut's laws against poisoning by making it illegal to use a poison to induce an abortion in a woman 
quick with child. Like earlier common law, the statute did not make it illegal to induce an abortion prior to quickening. Over the next two decades, 10 states, including Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, New York, and Maine, passed abortion laws. In the early 19th century, the concern legally was about a woman's life and about medical practice. The laws about abortion were really about poisoning and about controlling quackery and making sure that doctors and pharmacists who provided abortifacients could be held legally liable if they provided women with poisons. So the concern had nothing to do with the fetus except after quickening, but really was about a woman's life and about medicine. But attitudes were about to shift radically under the impact of deep social changes. The rise of the women's movement, the organization of doctors into the American Medical Association, and the decline in the national birth rate. The birth rate, in fact, fell dramatically throughout the 19th century. In 1800, the average American woman bore seven children. One century later, that number was reduced by half. They either used abstinence, they tried a variety of different kinds of birth control um, devices or uh, drugs, many of which didn't work, and above all, they aborted. In colonial America and probably throughout, all the way up through the 19th century, through the last century, the major form of birth control was abortion. None of this was really talked about in public. It was coded. Mail order houses sold potions, uh, douches, and various other items purportedly for feminine hygiene. In reality, these coded words referred to abortifacients, that is, chemicals that could be used to perform an abortion on a woman. As contraception and abortion became more widespread, they increasingly became a political issue. Starting in the 1840s and peaking in the 1880s, there was a national campaign against birth control in general and against abortion in particular. In part, this opposition to birth control and abortion represented the concerns of those opposed to the rising movement for women's rights. And they became concerned that what was going on was that uh, women were trying to, and I'm, I'm using the kind of language they would use, were trying to evade their domestic responsibility were trying to go against the divinely ordained system in which women were supposed to be primarily wives and mothers. And people were alarmed by the decline in the birth rate, but the way they interpreted it was as if this decline in the birth rate was a plot of the women's rights movement. Nineteenth-century feminists, ironically, were also opposed to both abortion and contraception. They had an entirely different proposal for a fertility control, one which I know from past experience in talking about this will be quite shocking to contemporary listeners. Their proposal for birth control was abstinence, except when a conception was desired. They were very concerned to establish the premise that uh, that even in marriage, sex should be voluntary, which was really a new and a radical idea. The initiative for outlawing abortions in the mid-19th century came not from religious leaders, but from the medical profession. The medical profession got involved in the mid-1800s as it was starting to organize itself as a profession. And it was frankly rather threatened by the fact that midwives were performing a good deal of abortions and the doctors wanted to have control over this medical procedure. New medical knowledge had led doctors to doubt that quickening represented a significant point in the development of the fetus. Many therefore concluded that abortion before quickening should be regarded as seriously as abortion after quickening. Mm -hmm. 
In 1857, Horatio Robinson Storer started what was to become a nationwide doctor-led campaign against abortion. He urged the fledgling American Medical Association to, in his words, enter an earnest and solemn protest against the unwarrantable destruction of human life. In 1859, at the AMA's annual meeting in Louisville, Kentucky, Storer's resolution was adopted unanimously. It called upon state medical societies to influence their legislatures to pass strict anti-abortion laws. The very next year, Connecticut became the first state to enact such a law. Among other provisions, it made it illegal for a woman to arrange for an abortion, to have one performed on her, or to attempt one herself. The Connecticut law became a model for the rest of the nation. By the 1880s, almost every state in the Union had a strict anti-abortion law. In some states, abortion would remain illegal for more than a century. The 19th century campaign to regulate sexual practices reached its peak in the person of Anthony Comstock, who in 1873 founded the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. Anthony Comstock was a part and parcel of a larger movement, a social purity movement, which was very concerned and fearful of what was going on in urban America in the 19th century. And what was happening was there was an influx of immigrants. And these immigrants were out of control as far as the older Protestant America viewed them or considered them. He was concerned that the United States was going to hell, literally and figuratively. That the representatives of the devil were in the form of gambling, in the form of prostitution, alcohol, discussions of, of physiology, including sexuality, birth control, that all of these things, he linked them all together and they're all spinning out of control. And it was his calling, his divine calling. God had called him for a special purpose, and that was to suppress these conditions. And he went about it with great vigor and energy and success from his point of view. Anthony Comstock viewed birth control as immoral, disgusting, and murderous in the sense that the only time you should spill or waste your seed or uh, come, that a man, man should come, to put it in the vernacular, uh, is when he is seeking to reproduce. Otherwise, it's wrong, it's immoral, it's horrible, and you're, who knows what life you're cutting short in the process. In 1873, Comstock and his Societies for the Suppression of Vice successfully lobbied through Congress an anti-obscenity law generally known as the Comstock Law. The Comstock Law was a law regulating the U.S. Postal Service, and it declared that obscene materials could not be sent through the mails. What's important here is that any materials that had anything to do with birth control were specifically designated as obscene in that law. Comstock was appointed a special agent of the post office with the power to read, seize, and destroy anything he deemed in violation of the act. One of Comstock's critics, feminist writer Angela Haywood. Shall we submit to the loathsome impertinence which makes Anthony Comstock inspector and supervisor of American women's wombs? But Comstock answered his critics with vigor. The attempt to suppress obscene literature and advertisements is likely to be successful now that it is backed by a congressional law. 
Already, the Herald has been obliged to weed out its infamous advertisements, advertisements which have brought ruin to the souls and bodies of countless human beings. Following his national successes, Comstock organized state and regional societies to promote his vision of social purity. His New England Society for the Suppression of Vice described the impurity it was fighting. There is a hydra-headed evil, malignant, unrested, and for the most part invisible, making the youth of the land its victims, dragging them by the thousands to mental, moral, and even physical disease and death. In order to close any loopholes in the federal Comstock law, 46 states passed new laws or reinterpreted old ones to further restrict contraception. Anthony Comstock's supporters had succeeded on both federal and state levels in virtually outlawing the sale and distribution of contraceptives. Connecticut's law banned not only the sale and distribution, but also the use of contraceptives. It would make Connecticut a crucial battlefield in the struggle over contraception for nearly a hundred years. Curiously enough, the fight for the Comstock Law in 1879 was spearheaded by P.T. Barnum, the great circus impresario who happened to be a very influential state legislator. And as someone who had brought wholesome middle class entertainment to the middle class at the time, he thought the same sort of values ought to prevail in terms of birth control. And that's one reason he fought for this law, which ended up banning the use of contraceptives in Connecticut from 1879 to 1965. Despite the Comstock laws, more and more Americans, especially the more affluent, were using contraceptives. The chance for poor women to have the same opportunity became the crusade of New York birth control advocate Margaret Sanger. My preparation as a nurse awoke me to the sorrows of women. Tales were poured into my ears. A baby born dead, great relief. The death of an older child, sorrow, but again, relief of a sort. The story told a thousand times of death from abortion and children going into institutions. I shuddered with horror as I listened to the details and studied the reasons behind them. Destitution linked with excessive childbearing. The waste of life seemed utterly senseless. Sanger began publishing a monthly newspaper advocating birth control as a means for the emancipation of women. Letters from women across the country poured in. Dear Mrs. Sanger, married at 20 to a laboring man, in 11 years I had five children, one stillborn and five miscarriages. Dear Mrs. Sanger, I am the mother of 19 children, and I'd rather die than give birth to another child. Dear Mrs. Sanger, I am only 34 years old and have given birth to 12 children, only three of them living. Dear Mrs. Sanger, I am afraid I am pregnant again. If I was sure, I would commit suicide. Sanger opened the first birth control clinic in Brooklyn, New York in 1916 and organized the American Birth Control League, which later became Planned Parenthood. 
By the mid-1930s, there would be birth control leagues in more than half the states operating 300 clinics. I believed it was my duty to place motherhood on a higher level than enslavement and accident. For those beliefs, I was denounced, arrested. I was in and out of police courts and higher courts. Indictments hung over my life. Connecticut's little Comstock statute was a natural target for the growing birth control movement. Catherine Beach Day, Catherine Houghton Hepburn, the mother of the actress, Annie Porritt. Those three women in particular are really the founders of the birth control repeal movement in Connecticut. Margaret Sanger got in touch with Mrs. Hepburn. They got together and uh, apparently Mrs. Hepburn took fire at this point and decided that we had to have it. A woman ought to have some say in the number of children she has. I believe in the freedom for men and for women to determine the size of their family. Why should they have 15 children if they can only afford to take care of two? The real goal of Mrs. Sanger and Mrs. Hepburn and the other Connecticut women was to be able to open public clinics so that low-income or poverty population women, often from immigrant families, would be able to get birth control advice and assistance at very low, if any, financial cost. The principal opposition was from the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic opposition was based on church doctrine as defined in an encyclical by then Pope Pius XI. Any use whatsoever of matrimony exercised in a way that the act is deliberately frustrated in its natural power to generate life is an offense against the law of God and nature, and those who indulge in such are branded with the guilt of a grave sin. The Catholic Church's teaching on contraception is that it is inappropriate to use artificial contraception to sever the natural relationship between sexual love and procreation. Um, this is not to say, as some have interpreted, that the church teaches that one ought to have as many children as biologically possible. Rather, the church teaches a doctrine called responsible parenting, which is to, as a couple, to uh, decide upon the number and spacing of your children using the natural means that your body already has available. After repeated failures in the legislature, the Connecticut Birth Control League decided in 1935 to go ahead and open a birth control clinic in Hartford with Dr. Hilda Standish in charge. Mrs. Hepburn was well known in the community and she managed to get together a remarkably fine group of people to serve as sponsors for the clinic and be on the board of directors lawyers, doctors, ministers, and so forth. Meeting little resistance in Hartford, the Connecticut Birth Control League opened several other clinics in Greenwich, New Haven, and Stamford. And then in the fall of 1938, uh, they again very quietly uh, open a, a clinic in what is, uh, at that time, the most Catholic city in Connecticut, Waterbury.
the priests under the leadership of Father Eugene Crane uh, got together uh, and they issued a, a decree to be read in all the Catholic churches. It is the teaching of the Catholic Church that birth control is contrary to the natural law and is therefore immoral. We hereby publicly call the attention of the public prosecutors and demand that they investigate and, if necessary, prosecute to the full extent of the law. And on the next Monday, the Waterbury police closed the clinic and sort of ran Margaret Sanger's friends out of town. Two detectives turned up at the clinic facilities on Field Street in downtown Waterbury and seized all of the diaphragms and other supplies that belonged to the Waterbury Birth Control Clinic. Members of the clinic staff were arrested and the Connecticut Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the law. The Connecticut Birth Control League decided it had no choice but to close all the clinics across the state. During the 1940s and 50s, the country was deadlocked between two cultures with very different attitudes towards sexuality and contraception. Like roses and clover, and that his are over. When I was growing up, um, contraception was ab absolutely taboo. I remember uh, when um, my brothers and sisters were born, we used to get ads from Planned Parenthood uh, at the door when my mother was coming home from the hospital with a baby, and oh, we were furious about that. We were Catholic, and this was something that um, uh, Catholic people uh, certainly were spiritually allergic to. It was regarded as somewhat of, akin to prostitution, that um, sex was to affirm the marriage covenant, and they knew that once contraception was socially acceptable, that it would facilitate uh, fornication and adultery. Before birth control was legal in Connecticut, Women had to drive out of state in order to get any reliable help with family planning. In the 1950s, I was part of a ministry team in a parish, an urban parish in New Haven. I was also newly married and uh, planning our family. And I would drive the parish van out of state in order to get help. And bit by bit, my neighbors asked to come with me. So eventually, I was driving carloads over the line into Porchester, New York, where it was legal to have birth control prescribed. Forsberg and others began transporting more than 2,000 patients a year from Connecticut to neighboring states for birth control services. In 1961, under the leadership of its president, Estelle Griswold, and backed by Dr. Lee Buxton, head of obstetrics and gynecology at Yale Medical School, Connecticut Planned Parenthood decided to once more defy the state's anti-birth control law. 23 years after the last Connecticut birth control clinics were closed, they opened a new clinic in New Haven. I was by this time very tired of driving to New York, so I called the clinic to see the doctor there. There was a citizen, a gentleman from West Haven, who was very upset at the opening of the clinic, who had been 
picketing the clinic every day that it, since it had opened and, w and kept calling the New Haven police and the mayor saying, why aren't you closing this down? Why aren't you closing this clinic down? I think that a Planned Parenthood center is like a house of prostitution. It is against the natural law which says that marital relations are for procreation and not entertainment. I think the state law is a good law and it should be enforced. When it was opened up, uh, they called a press conference and the uh, headlines in the Haven Register were uh, birth control uh, clinic opens, law to be tested, uh, principles uh, demand to be arrested. So they were. <laughs> From our point of view, it was, a, you might say, an easy case. The constitutionality of the statute had been upheld in Connecticut on five occasions. There were three federal statutes which prevented the uh, mailing, importing, or shipping contraceptives in interstate commerce coming into the country. There were laws in 30 states on the subject. It was, uh, it was the law. But the Supreme Court of the United States decided seven to two to overturn the Connecticut statute. Justice William O. Douglas wrote the majority opinion. We deal with a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. Marriage is a coming together for better or worse, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. Just half a century after Margaret Sanger's 1915 prosecution, the last legal prohibition of contraception in the United States was removed. Griswold involved the Connecticut statute which banned the use of contraceptives. It's a holy bizarre and uh, imaginary case. The Griswold decision has been criticized by former judge and Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork, who was a professor at Yale Law School at the time. None of us knew the law existed until the lawsuit was brought. It was a test case about a law that was never enforced. So that it was simply a desire to have the court make a cultural statement, which it did. Justice Douglas, who wrote the majority opinion, said that if you look at the Constitution, it protects various aspects of privacy. The Fourth Amendment about unreasonable searches and seizures in your home by the police protects an aspect of privacy. Uh, the First Amendment, when it protects religious uh, freedom, protects an aspect of privacy. Therefore, he said, gee, there must be a general right of privacy, which is not mentioned in any of the uh, explicit provisions of the Constitution. We find there's a general right of privacy. We find this statute violates that right of privacy and struck it down. The trouble with Griswold for a lot of its critics is that the court was unable to point to very much either in the precedents, that is the previously decided Supreme Court cases, or in the Constitution itself, or in the history of the 14th Amendment to explain why this right existed. And to critics like Judge Bork, and others, this is a fatal flaw. The word privacy, in quotes, is not, not to be found in the U.S. Constitution, as some critics of the decision have noted. It wouldn't be something you'd put into a Constitution because you assumed <laughs> that that was no business of the state. I mean, if you're, if you're going to have rights retained by the people, certainly the right to just be, be able to live your own life was sort of the basic one. And the Griswold case defined the control of human reproduction as an issue of constitutional rights. In the decades to follow, the nation would divide over conflicting claims for the right to privacy, the right to life, and the right to individual choice. In the 1960s, contraception became a right, but abortion remained illegal.
for the most part, abortions were performed by, by non-medical people in non-medical settings. They were performed with coat hangers. They were, were performed with all sorts of desperate means, women who wanted to try to self-induce abortions. But the ban on legal abortion began to be attacked by two of the groups who had most strongly supported it a century before, doctors and feminists. American physicians began calling for a liberalization of the very anti-abortion laws their professional ancestors had worked so hard to achieve a century earlier. Perhaps the emphasis on equality in the 1960s had something to do with it, because it became well known that wealthy women could afford an abortion and poor women could not. Whatever the reason, by 1967, a poll of physicians indicated that 87% favored some liberalization of the current anti-abortion laws. Interestingly, of course, it was the medical profession itself that played a major role in making abortion legal again. And we still have this generation of physicians now, although they are getting older, who keep reminding us why they did that, how many infected and dying women they treated when they called Saturday nights um, the, the Saturday night massacres because so many women would come in with the results of illegal abortions. I hope, too, that we've put an end to the idea that this is not a political issue. It is a political issue. We are the means of production, and the state means to control our bodies. We produce the soldiers, we produce the workers, and they fear the loss of that control. something happening here. I first became aware of it in a way individually because I myself desperately needed an abortion and was in the position of terror and fear and uh, you know all the emotions that came when that was illegal or not easily available. But it wasn't until many years later when as a reporter I went to cover an abortion hearing and it was the first time in my life that I've ever heard women stand up, or I had ever heard women stand up in public and tell the truth. And as women told what it was like to have to get an illegal abortion, other women stood up in the audience and told their stories, tears streaming down their faces. It was an incredibly moving experience, and it was the basic le lesson of feminism, which is we only learn the truth when we share the truth when we tell the true stories of our own lives. Stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. In many places, women, members of the clergy and others, organized underground railroads for women seeking abortions. In the earliest years, the only legal clinics and doctors that we had as places to refer women were outside of the country. Puerto Rico, England, Japan. They were all places where abortion was legal. Once we began using medical facilities within the United States, giving women the option of going to some place that was illegal, then we had to instruct them even more fully. If you're on the second floor, you need to look and see if you can possibly get out a window, whether or not it would be safe. You need to figure all the ways possible in case, for any reason, the place is raided. It was very cloak and daggerish and very demeaning for women and frightening. But the 1960s saw the rise of the women's liberation movement. Attitudes about sex were changing rapidly. What's interesting to me is how fast things moved from the issue of legalizing birth control to the issue of abortion being raised. Given the long history that it took to get the birth control thing done, and then it was just like, Phew! and that was the sexual revolution and women's consciousness. And somehow that all, somewhere between 65 and 69, things came together. <laughs> Say you 
All over the country, laws prohibiting abortion were being challenged in legislatures and courts. The New York State Assembly passed an abortion law, making it entirely a decision to be made by a woman and her doctor. There are no other requirements. The Supreme Court began hearing arguments which could affect the status of anti-abortion laws across the country. Women attorneys from Georgia and Texas contended that laws forbidding abortion are unconstitutional invasions of family privacy and the rights of women to bear or not to bear children. A case brought by young women lawyers from Texas was based largely on the Griswold decision making birth control a right. Finding Griswold was exciting. Griswold obviously was a case where the state had made it illegal to use birth control. And there was a line in the opinion that said the right of privacy. And it was almost like a, a feeling of celebration when I found those words. That was the, the springboard for Roe versus Wade. From CBS News headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her doctor, not the government. Thus, the anti-abortion laws of 46 states were rendered unconstitutional. The majority decision in Roe v. Wade was based on the right of privacy doctrine first stated by the court in the Griswold case. Roe is one of the worst decisions of this century, maybe the worst decision of this century, absolutely supported by nothing. And they ought to turn it back to the political process. There are those people who say there is no right of privacy. And there are others who said what the people writing the Constitution were trying to do is keep government out of our most personal uh, aspects. And so there is a difference of opinion. I think Bork is wrong. Conflicting responses to the Roe decision would lead to the organization of powerful social movements under the slogans pro-choice and pro-life. I basically became concerned when the Supreme Court rendered the Roe v. Wade decision on January 22nd, 1973. Virtually all 50 states had laws on the books to protect the life of the unborn child with the rare exceptions. And it was hard to believe that all of a sudden in our society it was okay to destroy an unborn child. There were about three or four of us women who were pretty much, you know, again, we were all about the same age, young mothers, who thought that we should try to do something in our own state to change what was happening and to start finding other people who shared our concerns. And our real objectives, and mine always has been from day one, was to get our laws back into place that are going to protect the unborn child. I really thought a few years and we're going to turn this thing around. But in fact, for the next two decades, abortion remained a deeply divisive issue. Move off to the side of the street or you will be arrested. Basic biology tells us when life begins. It was outrageous for the high court to skirt around that issue and leave it up to the philosophers and theologians. Life begins at the moment of conception. It's when each and every one of our lives began. It's as simple as that. That's the beginning of life. Reproductive freedom as a basic human right, that is the right to decide when and whether to have children. Some part of that, of reproductive freedom, has been the basis of every women's movement since time immemorial in every country and every culture. Reproductive freedom is a basic human right.
Throughout history, the rules and beliefs governing human reproduction have changed repeatedly. Abortion and contraception went from being widely accepted in the 18th century to completely outlawed in the 19th century. In the 20th century, contraception again became widely accepted. Abortion became legal, but remained controversial. The arguments used have also changed. In the 19th century, most feminists saw contraception and abortion as vehicles for male domination. In the 20th century, they saw them as women's rights. Similarly, the 19th century campaign against contraception was led by Protestants pursuing social purity. A century later, most Protestants were strong advocates of birth control as a means of family planning. And while Catholic doctrine continues to condemn artificial birth control, Catholics in practice use contraception just as much as the rest of the population. In the years ahead, technological changes and changes in society will no doubt transform the way we see these issues yet again. Well, a lot of the new technologies, including RU-46, the French abortifacient, are moving the debate into a different context because they allow earlier abortions, for one thing. It is moving very much toward a morning after pill, uh, a form of birth control that does not require pre-planning necessarily, um, that provides an abortion at the stage where we're really still talking about a blastula or a zygote rather than even a fetus. Just look at how viability continues to go down with the unborn child. I mean, they, it, the more they develop these highly sophisticated uh, support systems, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point there will be artificial wombs that, uh, that a baby will be able to develop and grow in. <laughs> The future debate will be transformed not only by technological changes, but also by social changes, like the growing diversity of our population, the evolving role of government and business in healthcare, and the changing relations between the sexes. Today, after a long history of compromise and political struggles, we have a law that basically permits most abortions but still prohibits some. Now the question remains whether, in the 21st century, women's reproductive rights will come to reflect their rapidly changing social roles. The control of human reproduction is one of those deeply divisive issues that can challenge the stability, even the survival, of a democratic society. Can we reconcile our conflicting moral certainties with our need to live together as members of one society? Americans take moral questions very seriously. The United States began with a moral conflict, slavery, which resulted in a war in which more Americans died than all of the wars combined. Alcohol has presented moral controversy, and we have swung from open use to prohibition and back again. Abortion is one of those great moral questions that may appear to be settled at one time, only to erupt anew later in our history. Few of our bitter controversies are ever finally put to rest.
Funding for this program was provided by the Wallace Alexander Grabodi Foundation, the General Service Foundation, the Deer Creek Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS.